So at the end of the lecture, I will upload the video recording. Uh, the recording is going to include everything on the projector plus my voice. So all the things, everything that I do that you can see on the projector will be recorded. Obviously, things that I'm doing on the whiteboard, which I'll try to keep to a minimum, will not be recorded. But the voice will still be recorded. So when I talk about stuff, it will still be recorded. Um, if you guys can speak up when you ask questions, your questions will also be recorded. Okay, so, you know, that's, you know, I hope you guys don't mind, you know, having your, your questions also recorded. All right, so we're going to get started today. And we are going to start with... other screen right here all right so the recording on Monday is also available even though it was recorded using zoom um, it is available I hope some of you have checked it out because you know if I were a student you know even as a professor I would you know, go back to the recording from the previous class just to remind myself you know what I talked about in the previous class so right now you know, here we go all right so I just you know, need to fast forward, kind of close to the end. And this is a Zoom player. You know, it doesn't work as well as YouTube. So you know, sometimes it just has. Now, what a if you really got it? I have no idea what it is. Okay. All right. So that's kind of you know, what I would do in the class. You know, is to go back to the recording of the previous you know, session and just kind of remind yourself, you know, what topic we are on. You know, when we continue with the class like this. So do we have any questions about the previous lecture or the lab from Monday? No questions? All right. So in case you need to get back to the lab, you know, the lab instruction, because you say, okay, I need to practice a little bit on my own. I have uh, practice stuff here. You know, this is now visible to you. And I will start to unlock duplicates of the lab instructions. So this way, you know, if you say, I want to kind of, kind of go through the, the lab again, you know, you can do so, okay, you can do it. It doesn't count for points anymore, um, but it, you can actually go back and redo the lab if you want to, just for practice purposes. Um, I have finished grading the first uh, submission, you know, so basically the largest sim set up, you know, um, submission. I have graded all of those already, and I think, as far as I know, the whole class got four out of four for that submission. So good job. Um, this is this may be the first time that my entire class you you know, turn in everything and got full points for everything too. So good job doing that. All right. So with that, I am going to go back to physical states, truth, numbers, and computers. Because we still have a few you know, things on here that is not done yet. And this is not the link that I want to use. So I'm going to go back to the other link here. Go to directory. It's the same stuff, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a better presentation of the content. All right. So last time we talked about the truth table of a NAND gate. In other words, we have already finished the material all the way through this, all the way to the truth table. So are we doing okay so far? Does everybody remember that this is where we kind of stopped the lecture on Monday? Very good, all right. So if you're nodding and you're like, yep, yep, I got it. Great, you know, you're either you're paying really a lot of attention in class, you took notes, or you just reviewed you know, your own notes you know, prior to the class, or watched the video prior to the class. On the other hand, if somebody is going like, I have no idea what we talked about last time, at the beginning of the semester, like the second class, I won't start to worry just yet, you know, because you know, there's still time to catch up, but it's not um, something that you want people want to kind of keep doing, okay? So it's really important to keep up with the material. So what we do today, or what we do now, is to talk about you know, why NAND is all that we need. So in order to do a NOT gate, instead of just saying you know, um, the negation, this is, by the way, the mathematical symbol for negation, and this is the mathematical notation for NAND. 
So not x is the same thing as x nand x. So the question is, what does that mean, right? So the first thing is, what is nand? You know, when I say x nand x, what does that actually mean? And in the previous section here, it spells out you know, what NAND is. So NAND is basically the negation, if you read this portion here, it is basically the negation of an AND. That's why it's called NAND, because the first N stands for negated. So a NAND gate is a negated AND gate. So what is the difference between a gate versus an operator? It's just concept. In your program, when you say, oh, I need this to be a condition in, you know, to get into the loop or stay in the loop, or this is the condition for the then branch for this statement, that is an operator, okay? We call it an operator because the symbol is between the two values that it is operating on. So it's why, that's why it's called an operator. A gate, on the other hand, is simply something that is in a circuit. So it will take two inputs, it will perform the same thing, which is the AND operation, and then the output is the conjunction or the AND between those two values. So are we doing okay so far with that discussion? Logic gate is basically an operator, but in the context of a circuit. So that's you know, how you can bridge what you know in programming from CISP 360 to some of the terms that is new to you in this class. All right, so given that NAND is really the negated AND like this, in this case, W is basically X NAND Y, now we want to find out what exactly is X NAND X. Well, you just you need to expand what NAND means, and then you can evaluate the expression. So why do I know about this equality? You know, how can I prove that the negation of x is actually really the same thing as x nand x. The best way to do this is a um, truth table. So basically all we need to do is to evaluate all possible uh, combinations. In this case, there's only one variable. So we have to look at all the possible values for x. And then just to make sure that the negation of x is really the same thing as x nand x. So if I were to do this by hand, okay, and that this is also why I have my uh, tablet here, because you know, this way I can, instead of using the whiteboard, which cannot be easily captured, I can now use my tablet where I can just write you know, in, free, in free form and then it will capture everything in the loop form. So the way we do this is we use a truth table. In this case, there's only one variable, x itself. x is Boolean, so it is either a false or a true. So that sets up, you know, what, how many rows we have, you know, in the truth table. So if you only have one Boolean variable, then you can only have two rows because you know, the variable can only be either false or true. Are we okay so far with that? Okay. So the first column is going to be just the negation of x. I'm using the truth plus plus operator here, so that's pretty easy. <coughs> the negation of false is true. The negation of true is false. That's something that you learn from CISP 360 as well as CISP 300, even though the, uh, the shape of the operator may not be the same. So now we go ahead and look at x nand x. So x nand x is really the negation of x and x. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated but we really know how to evaluate this expression here. Okay, I'm just putting a bubble here. Do we know how to evaluate that? Okay, so what is, uh, what happens when x is false? If x is false, then false and false is false. The negation of false is, is true. Okay, let's put it on here. And what if x is true, then x is true, True and true is true, the negation of true is false, so we put a false here. Do you see how this column and this column have exactly the same values for every single row? That means the two expressions are equivalent. They are exactly the same. They, are, they can be used interchangeably. Is that okay? So this is how we can establish that, oh, so if we have a NAND gate, we can use it to implement 
a not gate. We don't have to make a not gate out of transistors, you know, because we can actually always use a NAND gate where the both input connects to the same actual um, value, then the output is just the negation of the input. Okay? So when we get back to the notes, it will also you know, address the other operators that we are familiar with. You know, the other one is AND. This is the mathematical notation of AND. Um, so I claim that X AND Y is the same thing as X NAND Y NAND X NAND Y. Okay? A little bit more clumsy, a little bit more kind of nested. So I make this claim. What are you going to do? Well, I'm trying to drill it in your head. You said the sum of two means plus two i x is four forty for me as well. So the mentality I want my students to have is, well, Ted just made a claim, but I'm not sure about whether this claim is true or not. Okay, I want to verify this claim. So what do you do? To verify that claim. The truth table. Hmm? The truth table. Exactly. So you make another truth table. This time is how many rows are we going to have? There'll be. Okay, x can be true, it can also be false. But when x is true, y can be true or false. When. So how many rows do we have? We're going to have four rows. Exactly. All right, so let me kind of graphically show you how we think about this, okay? You can think about this, hmm, maybe it's a little early for uh, the graphical or the tree representation, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So if you think about this as a tree, okay? The first one is, okay, let's talk about X. X can be false, it can also be true. And then at the second level, we're concerned about Y. So when X is false, Y can also be either false or true. When X is already true, same thing, Y can also be either false or true. So that's why there are four possible outcomes when you have two independent variables. It is important that X and Y are quote unquote independent, which means when X is false, Y can be false or true, okay? The, the value of X does not change, does not impact the value of Y or vice versa. So in this case, we're going to have two independent variables, x and y. x can be false, y can be false or true, y can be false or true, and that's why the truth table has four rows in this case. So I recommend that you guys work this one out. I'm not going to work it out, but I'll give you the template. So on one column, you're going to have to evaluate what is x and y. In the other column, you're going to have to evaluate that really kind of complicated thing, which is your x and y, the whole thing, and x and y. Okay? So you have to kind of eva evaluate for every single column, for every single row, you know, figure out whether it's true or false. If in the end, this column has exactly the same value as this column over here, then the two expressions are equivalent. And you don't have to use Boolean algebra because you know, the truth table is going to exhaustively tell you whether the two expressions are actually the same or not. So this is also why Boolean algebra sometimes is kind of cool because you know, the proof does not always have to involve the use of algebra. You can use a truth table to get to the answer. All right. So this is my suggested activity for you. Does that mean I'm going to collect it and grade it? The answer is no. But does it mean that this might be helpful for you to understand the material? The answer is yes. So you have to kind of choose and make up your own mind to whether to do this or not. Okay. And if you decide to do this, you kind of have to remind yourself to do it because you know, in the lecture, you know, we you can do this after the lecture. All right, so we are moving on to or. So once again, you know, or, this is the mathematical symbol of or. This is not, this is or. And this time I'm giving you the actual derivation, but the derivation itself is not important. This is not CISP 440. 
So I do not expect people in this class to learn Boolean algebra. I will expose you to Boolean algebra. It's just that you, you just have to know. If you're going to take CIFT 440, you're going to have to read, you need to learn Boolean algebra in that class. If you have already taken CIFT 440, then you should know Boolean algebra already and kind of be able to follow the derivation here. So those two classes, these two classes are related, but they're not exactly the same. So I have to kind of keep the scope of this class to mostly assembly language programming and computer architecture. And then 440 will focus more on Boolean algebra and how to derive equations or expressions. So are we good so far with this? So what is the claim here? The claim here is if I just want to you know, uh, express you know, x or y, it ends up to be the same thing as x nand x, the whole thing nand, y nand y. Okay? So you can see how this is just a minor change from the and. Because this one is using x nand y to nand itself. This one is using x, and x nand x to nand y nand y. So they look about the same, mm. structured about the same, but they're not the same. So once again, I would make this a s you know, kind of like a short exercise for you guys to do when you are out of this class and out of the last class. This will be one of, the, of the things that you can do for the extra, well, in this case, three hours in today's lecture, because the lecture is hour and a half. So that means that you are supposed to be spending three additional hours on your own when you're studying. And this will be one of those activities that you can do on your own. Now, if you do this, okay, and you go like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm getting it for the most part, but I'm not getting the same result that proves you know, these two uh, expressions are the same, you can bring it up, you, know, you can come to my office hour. The official office hour is right after the class. I actually have to go meet the dean today, um, but I still have half an hour or so. So if you do have questions, you can follow me to the office and then I can try to address your questions. Um, but I'm usually in my office from 7 a.m. So if you come to campus early, and you go like, okay, I got a few questions, you know, let's just check whether Cash is in his office or not, you can do so. Okay, if I am in my office and I'm not in a conference or a meeting or anything like that, just knock on the door, you know, on the outside. If I'm in my office and I hear your knocking, you know, I'll come out and go like, okay, well, come ask questions. Is that okay? So, you know, when you can ask me questions is not limited to just the published office hours. Okay, just about any time you see me and I'm not busy doing anything else, go ahead and ask questions. Are we good so far? All right. So we can use truth tables to show validity of the NAND emulation of the other you know, commonly used gates. This is a good exercise to make sure that you understand the NAND gate is, uh, your understanding of the NAND gate is correct. Okay, so not too much going on here. The next paragraph is really just a lead in to base conversion, okay? How do we represent values when all you have are zeros and ones? Okay, so before we go there, okay, I just want to remind you that zero is and false are pretty much the same thing. Because you know, physically, it just means you know, the voltage at the gate is low, okay? Close to zero. What about one and two? Well, it just means the voltage is quote unquote high. Is that okay? So I, we are we're basically interpreting physical quantity, in this case voltage, to the logical meaning, you know, which is either a zero or one, or numerical meaning, which is, uh, okay, the other one is false or true, and then numerical meaning is zero or one. Are we doing okay so far? All right, okay. So if we are doing okay, then we're gonna move on to the next slide or the next module. So my module, I started using the term module way before we started to use Canvas. So my module, you're basically referring to the content or the actual um, stuff that you need to understand in this class. Um, they are usually pretty short, okay? You know, they, you know, each one can be covered in one to two classes. 
there are certain occasions where it gets a little bit longer than you think that three chapters can take. But each one is, is, is basically a little short. It covers three specific topics. So in module 0282, we, talk, we are going to talk about what is the value, what is the number, and what does base have anything to do with it. I will point out where you can access you know, this particular module. It is down here a little bit right here. Okay. And you know, this is usually just what I do. You know, I sequentially go over the linked material one by one. So if you want to read ahead, you just have to kind of scroll down and find out, oh, okay, this is the next link and I'm going to read it. Today's lab is on NAN2. This is your lab. You won't, you're not seeing it just yet, okay, because I have not made it visible yet. But this is what you'll be doing, and there is also a file submission related to it so that I can grade it. Some of these links you don't see at all because they are outdated, okay. I used to encourage students to use a Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, I found a way around that, so it's not needed anymore. So uh, by the time we get to that point, you know, it, we can talk about it. Um, the other links you know, that are between the two modules, uh, this is your lab. This one is kind of useful because this is explains how I test the circuit that you turn in for. Okay, it explains all the steps, it explains how to do it you know, using the command line interface. But it's written in text. This is a video recording of the same thing. So if you are new to the command line and go like, I have never used your DMD in Windows, or you're using Mac OS and you have never used the terminal before, watch that video, okay? It will give you all the essential basic concepts that you need in order to navigate in a command line interface, otherwise known as a CLI. Are we good so far? Okay. Do you think a CLI is going to be useful, not only in this class, but also in your other classes and possibly after you get employed? Okay, yep. And why is that the case? Why don't we just use Ruby for everything? Yes. Ruby for the class. I mean, it's supposed to be like, like let's say you want to make this like a test or something like that. Mm -hmm. Why would, I mean, if it's simple enough and you don't need to have this written code, you just have it be a CLI. And mm -hmm. oftentimes that's So when you're doing like system administrative kind of thing, you know, you do not need a full GUI. Right. So the nice thing about the GUI is, you know, uh, it has many you know, buttons. It ha you know, when you hover over something, it tells you what it is and helps you understand you know, how you can fill in the blanks. So it's good. But from the automation perspective, it's a nightmare. Okay, if the only way to do something is to go through the GUI, where you have to fill in multiple boxes and then click this button and then click this, this button afterwards, how are you going to automate it? Like a robot that has eyes and hands so that the robot can do this? Well, maybe. Okay, I think robotics is getting to the point where it might be able to do it. But command line is easy. Because as long as you can type the command line, you know, um, as long as you can type the command um, in a text window, you can put that command into a text file. In Windows, we call those the batch files. In uh, Linux or Mac OS, we call those you know, uh, shell files or you know, yeah, shell scripts. Then you can just run the whole thing. If you have a complicated procedure you know, that consists of like 40 steps, okay? If you were to do it by hand, it's gonna be a tedious task. But if you can put all those 40 steps into a batch file, you just run the batch file. The 40 steps will be automatically executed. But the best part is, bash, even in a bash file in DOS, okay, which is the really archaic version of PowerShell, they can do conditional statements. They can do loops. They can specify the logic of how to do something, and then it will do it automatically. So that means you know, efficiency. Even if you're not a system administrator, this can be super helpful. This is how I grade your homework assignments. <laughs> I'm not clicking, I'm not o downloading each and every single file, going to Logic Stream through the GUI interface, okay, load your file, click on that clock thing, observe how your circuit is outputting something, and then double check that against you know, the, the key. I have a script 
to do it all automatically. I download every single you know, structure file in one as one zip file, and then I have one you know, uh, script you know, which is written in JavaScript to do the whole thing, short of entering the grades into your know, Canvas. That part can probably be done too. I just haven't got to that, got into that part yet. <laughs> so, command line interface, useful stuff. You might want to get used to it. Yes. Do you have a link um, for the Excel example? Because you might have to go on like Excel. Excel, I use Excel Navigator just to navigate in Excel. Right. So if you get to any of the modules, you go, you click on module. It will bring you to the actual quote unquote home page of all the modules. And then right here there's a directory. And then the directory will give you, you know, a directory of everything that I have written. Not all, a very small fraction is related to this class. Oh, okay. Yeah, but to go to the ones that are related to this class, your canvas shell is the best way to do it. No, no, no. I, I write all kinds of stuff, you know, and you, you guys are welcome to go to the directory and kind of read the other ones too. It's, it's just that they will not be related directly to this class. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what we'll do now is we are going to get into values, numbers, and bases, okay, which is really dry and boring. And then if you go through this whole thing here, it's all equations and numbers and text and stuff like that. Totally boring. So I'm going to do a few examples first, okay? And then we'll talk about you know, all those you know, formula that are in the module itself. All right, so I'm going to go back to my tablet. And I can even maximize this one. Okay, so we'll maximize this. So this way it's easier for you guys to see it. So I'm going to turn the new page. And then we'll start with base conversion, okay? But wait, we haven't talked about base conversion, okay? Some of you might have some exposure to what we call base to number and so on, but I'm gonna assume that you don't, okay? So we'll start with something um, that's even harder. Okay, like, why are you starting with something that's even harder? Okay, just give me a second, okay? So I went to a place to have a lunch yesterday um, the change that I'm supposed to be getting is four dollars and I have to see the number that works out in this case, 75 cents, okay? So this is the change that I'm supposed to get you know, from the from the restaurant. So I want to ask you, you know, if you are the person who has to give me the change, how do you figure out you know, what to what to give me? just going to give you the answer, okay, right? So the correct answer is uh, four, one dollar bills, and three quarters. Okay, you guys go like, okay, well, that's kind of hard. But why don't you just say, oh, I can just give you 475 cents. It's the same word, right? But it's not, the customer doesn't, probably will not like that, right? You, know, you just hand a whole bag of change. That's a change. But how do you know that it is four one dollar bills and three quarters? Okay, let me give you another example. This one I cannot carry into the, uh, the binary example, but it will work well in the base 10 example. So this one is a little bit more complicated. Seven dollars and 58 cents, okay? That is super tricky, right? So you guys go like, it's not tricky at all. One five dollar bill, two one dollar bills, two quarters, and three pennies. No, wait, uh, two quarters, one nickel, and three pennies. Yeah? And you guys go like, how could that be hard? It is not hard, but it is actually hard. Why do you think this is hard? Because when you look at the multiplier between the, denom uh, the um, denominators, it is not easy. So I'm going to put a dollar here. What is uh, the coin that is less than a dollar, that is commonly used? We do have half dollar coins, but they're rare. So what, what, which coin do we usually have 
that is just less than one. Quarter. Very good. So we have quarters over here. And then which coin is less than a quarter? A dime. And then what is less than a dime? A nickel. And what is less than a nickel? Penny. Okay, very good. And then on the other side, what is the most common bill that we still use that is not more than a dime? Yeah, but they're rarely used, right? right. So five dollar bill is really just a coin. And then after that, ten dollar bills. And then after that, okay, hold on here. Okay, so if you look at the penny to a nickel to to a dime and to a quarter, you would probably think it's a twenty-five dollar bill. But no, it's not. It's a ten dollar bill. And then after that. Fifty dollar bill. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll stop here because I don't think I have enough money for a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> Did they give you a book? So when you look at the actual ratio between these things, let's try to figure out whether there's a pattern. Here's a five, right? You know, there are five pennies in a nickel. There are two nickels in a dime, and then this one is kind of strange because we have two and a half dimes in a quarter. And then we have four quarters in a dollar. And then we have five one dollar bills in one five dollar bill. Two five dollar bills in a ten dollar bill. Two ten dollar bills in a twenty dollar bill. And then two and a half twenty dollar bills in a fifty dollar bill. So you guys managed to not only have all of this memorized, but you were quick to basically say, oh, okay, I know exactly what is the minimum number of bills and coins to use to make up $7.58. You already know more than they can know. All right? Okay, so let's switch back to this example here. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna make this one a little bit more complex, okay? So we'll try to figure out $5.75. Forget about this one. We'll try to figure out five dollars and seventy-five cents. But this time, um, we are using cash currency. Okay. So instead of using this U.S. currency, which is what you see on the right-hand side, this time we're using cash currency. So now we will take a look at cash currency. So there's always a one-dollar bill. Okay. But the one, the coin right below a dollar bill, is a half dollar. And then the um, bill, uh, the, the coin below that is a quarter of a dollar, and we can even imagine that there's, a, there's a, a one eighth of a dollar. On the other side, uh, the next dollar bill is a two dollar bill, the one next to it is a four dollar bill, the next after that is an eight dollar bill. So if I were to continue with this, what is the next one? Sixteen, very good, because I'm double, right? I'm just doubling everything from the one before. Okay, so first thing first, if this is the actual currency, do you think you can make the adjustment and say, yeah, I think I can get this one? Using the same reasoning that you already used with the US currency, can you adapt and go like, oh, okay, you know, it's a little strange, I'm not used to it, but I think I can learn how to use it. Yes? Okay, do you think it's easier or harder? Way more difficult because there's always a multiplier of two. You don't have to memorize anything. In fact, if you ever have cousins from a foreign country coming here, okay, and you're trying to teach them how to use the U.S. currency, I think mine is going to be a lot quicker to teach compared to the U.S. currency because there's no regularity whatsoever with the U.S. currency. But with this one, oh, okay. A little strange, okay, because most countries, you know, do the you know, uh, multiplication by 10 or something like that. This one's all by two. All right, so getting back to $5.75, what are you gonna do? Well, we'll, we'll take a look at, you know, the $8 bills, the $4 bills, $2 bills, $1 bill, the half dollar, the quarter dollar, and the eighth dollar. 
Let me try to figure out how many of each do we need to make up five dollars and seventy-five cents. Okay? I'm telling it I'm turning this into a very systematic method, right? So how many eight dollars do we need for that? None, because five point uh, five point seven five is less than eight, right? So we say nope, don't need any one of these. What about four dollar bills? We're gonna need one of those. But after that one four dollar bill, we're gonna have one point seven five left, right? So how many two dollar bills do we have? One dollar bill? One. And a half dollar coin? And a quarter? One. And that's a zero here. You see how easy it is? There's no division involved. Because you're all you're doing is comparing. Is the amount that I still need to make up greater than or equal to the current duty that I'm looking at? If it is greater than or equal to, it's one. If it's less, it's a, that's a zero. There's no division. Because in uh, US currency, you still kind of sometimes need to use the division. Okay, <coughs> not always, but sometimes you do need to use currency um, division. In this case, there's no division. But I think I see a binary number here. The, the binary point or decimal point is right here. So the way I write this binary number is basically 0, 1, 0, 1, point one one zero, and I'm, I'm going to use your parentheses too to emphasize that this is a base two number. So this number is really the same as what we know as 5.75, and once again, I'm emphasizing that we are using base camp. Typically, we don't say this is a base camp number because that's the default. But I'm just emphasizing that 5.75 as a base camp number specifies the same value as 0101.110 in base camp. Are we good so far? Okay. So why do you think we are interested in base two number? Because of the Exactly, okay, because computers, or digital computers, are based on zeros and ones. That we have established from the previous lecture on Monday. The logic is, what are the inputs here to that circuit that we built on Monday? <coughs> a zero or one. So zeros and ones are the only two digits that we can natively represent you know, in digital computers. Now I keep saying digital computers be because there are analog computers. Not used much these days, but there are such things. Okay, so now let me uh, you know, ask you another question, okay? I'm gonna hold up and you will tell me how many fingers is I'm doing this. Okay, so we, it is five, right? That's five. But it is also zero, one, zero, one in base two. How do I know? Because if there's one, one, none of two, and one of four. So when you add them up, it is specifying the, the value, the quantity that is that you're seeing here on my hand. Okay? So the value is this, okay? The value itself has no intrinsic name. It is simply a quantity. The number is what you're seeing on the projector. Five is a number in base 10, but 0101 in base 2 is also a number. In other words, a number is a way to represent a value. Okay, so let, let, let's give that sen sentence a little bit of time to sink in, okay? What is a value again, and what is a number? A value is just a quantity, okay? Um, you know, I can hold up you know, a different number of fingers, okay? That's just a quantity. When I say this is seven and write down the seven, you know, in base 10, it is a number representing that quantity. When I say it is also known as one, one, one in base two, that is also a number to represent the same value. 
So are we doing okay so far? We can kind of think of the value being an actual person, and then the number is basically the name of that person, the student ID of that person, the social security number of that person. It's just ways to identify that particular person. Are we okay so far with that terminology? Because it is very important in this class, maybe not in your other classes, to differentiate between a value versus a number. So are we doing, go are doing okay so far with other steps? All right. So the next thing I will talk about is how numbers work. So some of you are going to be bored because you, you, you know this stuff already. I think all of you are pretty bored. So I'm going to give you a base 10 number. Okay, you go like, um, okay, let's make it even more complicated. That's complicated, okay, it's in base 10. So if I were to ask you, well, what is the quantity represented by that number? You go like, what do you mean by that? It's 451.37. There are many ways to say this, right? Okay, so let's look at the alternative of specifying or telling us what quantity this is represented. So the first step is, I look at this as 400 plus 50 plus one plus plus three plus 0.07. Okay, is, is anyone, does anyone want to object and say, no, that is not a quantity? That's pretty obvious. Right? Then I go and go like, hmm, let's make this more cumbersome than it really has to be. In other words, I'm actually breaking something up into the components that we normally do not think about. So this, I'm going to say, is the same thing as 4 times 10 plus, okay, let, let's do it one, one step at a time. 4 times 100 plus 5 times 10 plus 1 times 1 plus 3 times point one plus seven times point oh one. Any objections? Any objections? Okay. So what what are you seeing? What is the pattern on the second line? It's it's okay, you know, if you don't want to because I think you guys know the pattern already. You just have not figured out how to articulate that pattern yet. Huh? We're getting on those students. Yep. Adding more points. So, yeah. But I, I think from the looks of you, I think you guys can, can recognize the pattern already. Oh, it's a bunch of blah, and all of those blahs will have a certain pattern to it. Okay? We have a quantity from zero to nine, multiplied by a power of 10. That's the pattern of each component of the solution. Is that okay? All right. So this happens a lot in my classes because what I typically want to do is to start with something that you are very familiar with, which is 451.37. Uh, you know what that means. But I'm breaking, up, breaking it up into components until we get to the point where, oh, okay, there's a pattern to this whole thing. Pattern recognition is very important in computer science and mathematics, but particularly in computer science. Um, if you want to be a, a software engineer or a developer, what do you do as a software engineer or a software developer? What, what is the main job description? Occupation. You write coding, right? And what exactly is a program? I don't, it doesn't matter what programming language. It could be C, C++, Java, Python, JavaScript. But what exactly is a program? Machine. It's instructions to the computer, right, to a machine, so that the machine can follow the instructions to do something that otherwise would be very tedious and boring for us to do. Okay? That is abstraction. Okay? It's abstraction. It is also called generalization <coughs> because we are looking at how people do certain things and then you're going like, oh, okay, let me try to describe the process 
in a way that is not specific to a certain instance of doing that something, I'm trying to describe the process of doing something so that you can reapply the instructions across a broad spectrum of you know cases where you need automatic checks. Okay, so my, my watch just buzzed, which means you know we are going to take a very short break, and we are taking road right now. I do not have it ready yet, so give me a second here to get the road taking activity done. But you might want to sign in to Canvas right now, either on your mobile device or you know on the computer in front of you. And when I'm done with this, I'll give you the access code, and then you just have to enter the access code and tell me that you are here today. Um, to right, so the, the there we go. August twenty-eighth, and let's make it do. I'll give you guys like 12 minutes to do it, you know, which is way more than what you need. <coughs> August 28th, 11.30 p.m. Save and publish. So you should be able to see it now if you refresh, and then the access code is octopus. I'm going to write it on the board here. I'll explain why you know the access code is octopus. <coughs> hmm? Sorry? Nope. Nope. It's not GitHub. Hmm? Yeah, but I'm going to give you examples of in base seven. You go like a seven with Kafka. It is Kafka. Kafka, not Kafka. Kafka is base. So seven with Kafka. Why do you use octo? Um, because you know. Octopus like us, octopi like us, you know, want to drink beer. So one of the tentacles, we just hold in a can of beer, so they only have seven tentacles left each of them. And that's why, you know, smart octopi will use base seven, so they can always have one tentacle left to hold to on, you know, hold on to the beer. <laughs> <laughs> and of course some of you are going like, but that's illogical. You know, because you know, octopi you know, live underwater. How can they? How can they be drinking beer when they're underwater? Well, obviously, you guys have not watched the SpongeBob. <laughs> All right. So, getting back to uh, where we were. Okay, this is where we are at currently at. And where's my tablet? Right here. Oh, right here. Okay. All right. So the next part is to go like, okay, let's express this even in a much even more you know, kind of mundane form, okay? <coughs> yeah, I'll, I always keep this door unlocked. You know, I, keep it, I put a pen so that it's you know, kind of left open. So you guys can, if you, you can exit through that door, but when you come in, you can always come in through this door. Um, and then we have what, seven, oh no, the three, three times 10 to the power of negative one. And then we have the seven times 10 to the power of negative two. Okay, so there we have it. Everything so far? You can see the pattern? You go like, yeah, but we actually know this stuff already. But did you make the connection before the class? That is the question. So this is what a number is. Every digit of a number is specifying the quantity of a particular power of whatever base that number is expressed in. 451 from 37 has an intrinsic base of 10. So that's why four is representing the quantity of 10 to the power of two. The position of the digit tells you which power of 10, that digit is specifying the quantity of. Is that okay? That was a complicated sentence. So I'll be okay with that sentence. Let me say that one more time, okay? The position of a digit in a number indicates the quantity of a power of the base 
that is also corresponding to the position of the number. Is that okay? All right. So now I'm gonna make this even more abstract because do you think 451.37 as a base 10 number is the only number that you ever have to know and to understand? Obviously not, right? So we want to generalize this so that we can deal with any number specified in any base. But to do that, we have to introduce symbols. So the way I introduce the symbol is whatever this digit is that specifies the quantity of the base to the power of zero, we'll call this V0, digit zero. This is digit one, this is digit two, and so on. This one here is in on the flip side. So can you guess what digit this will become? V of what? Negative one, very good. So this is V of negative one, this is V of negative two. Is that okay? So in other words, V of something is really just saying, I don't care what number you're talking about, V of zero is always the one that specifies the quantity of base to the power of zero. V of two is always the digit that specifies the quantity of base to the power of two and so on. So I'm just you know, generalizing you know, the notation here. And so now we can look at this number and go like, huh, okay. So that means you know, with this particular number, I can re-express the value in a summation format where i as an index is going from negative two to two in this case, v of i times the base, which is 10, to the power of i. Okay? Does that make sense to you? So we just went from something that is concrete, easy to understand, something that you can go like, yeah, I know what that is, to something that is like, whoa, hold on a second here. What is this? What is this here formula? It's just the abstraction. But this abstraction is not very general because all you can deal with is you know, I, you know, the digit going from negative two, which is two places to the right-hand side of the decimal point, to two, which is two pla three places to the, right, to the left-hand side of the decimal point. And it is also very specific to base 10. So I'm gonna go one step further and say the value represented by any number is going to be i going from a negative infinity integer to infinity integer v of i times whatever the base is raised to the power of i. So now we have a very general format where you know you can give me any number in any base and I know how what value it is trying to specify. So I'm just gonna pause here and see if there are any questions because I just went from this part here <laughs> to this. But is every step along this path understood? Are they all connected? So we're good with the notation, okay? We're good with the transition between all the steps. So one thing you can also do, you know, because I know taking notes when you're trying to pay attention to what I'm saying and what I'm saying sounds pretty you know, complicated, is difficult. One thing you can do is to note the time when I talk about it. Because everything is being recorded, I usually get the recorder started at nine o'clock. So if you just write down, okay, Tech, you know, started to talk about this, you know, how we kind of turn everything into a formula at 11.25, then you can go back to the video, you know, just kind of calculate the offset, which is what? Uh, one hour and, wait, this class started an hour ago, so it's about 55 minutes. So you can just fast forward 55 minutes into the video recording, and you'll be pretty close to this discussion, <coughs> just in case you want to revisit the few sentences that I said. Because you know, there's no need to copy everything on the whiteboard you know, onto your own notes because it's all being recorded. 
So it's better that you focus on the concept, but it's also good that if you just kind of jot down the time index so you can go back to the recording if you want to go back to the recording. All right, so that is how a number is represented. So now we're going to get to the octave discipline. So instead of using base two, which is pretty easy to work with, we're going to switch to base one. <laughs> so I'll give you a quantity, and then you will try to figure out the base seven number corresponding to that quantity. Is that okay? So we'll we'll work with something that uh, we'll work with this year. Okay, two thousand twenty-four. This is in base ten, and I want to figure out what it's going to look like as a base seven number. Okay. <coughs> thing we should do in this case? Well, the first thing, you know, conceptually, is to understand that this is specifying how many 7 to the power of 3 do we have. This is specifying how many 7 squared do we have. This is specifying how many 7 to the power of 1 do we have. And this is specifying how many 7 to the power of 0, which is 1 that we have. That we have. It does not make sense to go from right to left. Because uh, 2024 is 2024 times 1. That's not going to work. So we always want to start with the higher power, which in this case, I'm not even sure that 7 to the power of 3 is going to work out. So let's try to, try to figure out what the 7 to the power of 3 is. So that would be 49 times 7, because 49 is 7 squared already. So this is going to be 343. 7 of those is already going to cover 2024, so we're good. Okay. So 7 to the power of 3 turns out to be 343. This is 49. This is just 7 itself. That is just 1. So what I really am asking is how many 343s would fit into 2024? Uh, 5 of those. Okay. So we say, okay, so this is five. So after we have that five, we say I'm just gonna do the arithmetic of here. Five, one, multiply by three, this is a three. Oops, this is this, this one is this is a one. There's a two over here, one seven, one five. And then we subtract that from two thousand twenty-four. Seven three one five. Is that correct? No, yeah, it's one. <laughs> so when we do the subtraction, we have a nine, a zero, a three, and a zero over there. So this is the leftover. Does that make sense? Okay, does everybody know what I am doing? I'm trying to figure out the largest quantity of seven to the power of three that would fit into the quantity that I want to express. But that, that turns out to be five. So multiply is five. But after five times seven to the power of three, I'm gonna have three hundred and nine as a leftover. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. hmm? So now five times is not five. It's remainder. It's remainder. Yep, yep, that is correct. So now we look at three hundred and nine and then we ask how many 49 will fit here. So that the answer is six. Okay. And it has a remainder of 15. I can see nothing. <laughs> no, 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 very good. I just want you guys to help you verify my answer because you know, sometimes I, my mess, I, try, I think my mental math is correct, but it may not be. So there's a six over here, okay? So now we look at 15, and then we ask how many seven to the power of one, which is the seven will fit in there. We have two of those, okay? So 15 divided by seven is two with a remainder of one. So I don't need this. So now I claim that you know, five, six, two, one as a base seven number is representing 2024. So the, you can see the process is really the same. Okay, the base conversion process, starting with the higher power first, 
and see how many of these were put in the, the original value. And then once you have that taken care of, you have a remainder, you just reapply the same technique to the next available power until you're done with the expression of the next power. Are we, are we still okay so far with this? So we can also go the opposite way, okay? This time, you know, this one converts base 10 to base seven, but we can also convert from base seven to base 10, which is actually a conceptually easier process. So we'll start with, uh, let's, let's do the same thing, okay? But that's this time we have 2024 as a base seven number. We want to figure out you know, what is the number in base 10 that represents exactly the same value. So this one is actually easy. Because we already know, this is telling me how many ones we have. This is telling me how many sevens we have. This is telling me how many 49s we have. And this is telling me how many 343s do we have. So now, it is just a matter of multiplication and addition. Is that OK? All right, so let's, let's work this out. So now we have, I'm just using math to math here, 660. 686 plus uh, 0 of 49 plus 2 times 7, which is a 14, plus 4 times 1, which is a 4. So when you add up all of these, you end up with uh, 704 okay. in base 10. Okay? So here comes that nagging question again. How do I make sure that the, this is what Tech tells us, right? Tech claims that 2024 as a base 7 number is the same as what we know, understand as 704 in base 10. But how do I make sure that his math is right? What do you do? of the previous slide to convert it back into base 7. Now, it's not a sure fire way because you know, if I give you self-consistent, incorrect ways of conversion, it might just work out too. But it is still a good way to practice and double check my math. So, um, so that's you know, something that you guys can do you know, to kind of both having a practice and at the same time getting a better understanding of the material. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. So in the lecture, I really want to just kind of go through these examples to make all the connections from the, ab from the concrete to the abstract, and then go from the abstract, apply the abstract back so that you can use it to solve problems. But in the slides, in the actual module, I give you the actual equations. So in this case, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of discussion which, is, which has already happened. <coughs> but to convert something into a base, this is, this is all you need, okay? So let's take a look at just this equation here. So if I give you a value, typically the value is given to you in base 10, you have to reach the base 10. So if I give you V as a base 10 number, and I say I want to convert it to a base V number, so V can be for binary, it can be seven for a base seven number, it can be eight for base eight, and so on. So V divided by base raised to the power of I. So can someone tell me what is I? What is the purpose of I in this equation? See, I is serving as a subscript of V, so what is the subscript of V? index or the position of the digits. Okay, so I is the position of the digits, so V of I is a specific digit of the number. V is the base, and V is the value that we want to convert. So now we want to plug our example into this equation and see if we see if I made a mistake, see if Tech made a mistake. So the way I, I'm going to write it down here, okay, so we'll try to figure out 
what is um, so I is I'm sorry this one and then we'll just have B is seven and then B is seven hundred and four. Let's make it two. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to switch back to the tablet so you can see what I just wrote down. All right. So this is the case that we want to solve. Okay. It relates to what we just did. In other words, I'm taking this 704 and say that is the value that we want to convert into a number in the partition of A. 7 is the base. Okay. This is specifying the base that we want to convert the value into. And we are only interested in digits 2. Is that okay? Does everybody understand your, uh, what I, B, and B are representing in that equation? So now we try to carry out the um, operation. So now we say, this part is just plugging you know, the uh, I, B, and B into the original equation. So now we say B of two is the floor, this symbol means the floor of um, B, which is 704, divided by 7 to the power of 2, and then the whole thing also has to be modified by 7. So if we carry out this you know, conversion, then we have the floor of um, so 704 divided by 49 704 divided by 30, 349 is 14, I think. 14 point something. We can say this. <laughs> 14 point blah, blah, blah. Okay. That blah, blah, blah is not going to be important because we're taking the floor of the value. The floor of 14 point something is just 14. 14 mod 7 is what? Okay, so these are very good. Yeah. It is the remainder of digit eight. So fourteen divided by seven has a remainder of zero. So this is telling me that if I want to convert seven hundred and four in base ten into a base seven number, the digit two should be a zero. Okay. Does that match the base seven number that we have in the first place? So let's take a look. This is what? This is digit one. zero, digit one, and here's digit two. So this is also a good way to verify the value. Oh, okay, so at least everything is self-consistent. Are we doing okay so far with this? So today's lab has nothing to do with base conversion, so you still have some more time, like over the weekend, to really let this sink in, okay? Um, but the whole idea is we want to have ways to convert between the bases. Are we doing it okay? All right. So the whole thing about base conversion is pretty much done because if I go back to my slide here, this is the conversion process. So binary number is basically just saying, oh, okay, the base is two and that's all. Because if you can work with base 7 number, you can work with base 2 number. So let me uh, just kind of give you some additional examples, okay, so that you can have a little bit of practice. So this time I have 10110.101 in base 2. What is, the, what is the number in base 10 that represents the same value? How do you do this? So what is the, oh, okay, you guys cannot see it, sorry. I forgot to switch back to the tablets. There we go, okay. <laughs> no wonder you guys are like, <laughs> Okay, so the binary number is 10110.101, but I want to represent that quantity or the value in base 10. So how do you figure that out? Start by one 
one, two, four, six, mm-hmm. seven, seven. And yep. then from there, uh, is is it false or is it real? And you don't add that to the sum. You just add the value to the divide one, and then mm-hmm. it will give you the the base sum. Yep. So a more spelled out way is to visualize with what the quantity is associated with each digit. But because the number is in A2, right, so it's fairly easy to figure that out. And the whole idea of the decimal point, which is here, the whole idea of the decimal point is it is just marking where am I supposed to find the quantity of the base ratio power of B. Because without the point, I really don't know. Where is, where, where is your digit zero? So the point of the point is to tell you where to find digit zero. Digit zero is immediately to the left-hand side of the point. That's all. Okay? And of course, uh, if you are from Europe, you go like, no, 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 you Americans have this all wrong. The comma is telling you how to find digit zero, and then the point is what we use to separate the thousand from the million and so on. Because they, they definitely, they, they actually use the opposite to what you, you're used to. Okay, so getting back to this, okay? So this means yeah, we have 116, we don't have an 8, we have a 4, we have a 2, we have a half, and then we have an 8. So that's a 1, 2, 5, add them up, right? So we got 22.625 in base 10. So that's how we do the conversion. So inside the computer, okay, all the quantities that you need to represent, you know, are represented in a way similar to this, not exactly. So your the grade is, is not a whole number, it's not an integer. So it has, there are different ways to represent um, real numbers. So pi, you know, is represented in a certain way. So we'll get to that, okay? We'll get to double precision floating point number format, um, but not right now. So right now we are only focusing on, you know, just you know, looking at a number, do we know what value it is representing, or looking at a value to figure out what number it is representing. Yep. So this works, but in the computer there's not a dot when you're using binary, right? Say that one again? There's not a dot that's going to the computer. There's not a dot. Um, when you're entering a floating point number and it involves you know, like decimal numbers, you still need a point. But I think what you're saying is there's no point in base two. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because you know, inside the computer it's just a sea of zeros and ones. Yeah. So there's no actual point to say, oh, this is the this is where digit zero is located. Yeah. So the way we do it in inside the computer is either you explicitly say you know, where digit zero is with the, the floating point number representation, or you have a assumed position of where digit zero is, which is what we call a fixed point number. So we'll get to floating point number, we'll get to the double precision floating point number format. I'm not gonna go over your fixed point numbers because they're not as useful in programming, but there's one thing that is kind of, that makes the fixed point numbers important. Um, what do you think happens inside the GPU from NVD? What, what, is, what is it used for? For those of you who are gamers, you know, why do you spend 300 bucks you know, to buy the graphics card that has GPU? Yeah, it's just multiplication. It's really basic multiplication, but to be more specific, mm-hmm. it can carry out the calculations that are needed for games. Okay, especially if it's a 3D rendering, okay? Where are where where are the vertices you know, of each you know, polygon? And how do I match the texture onto something? Okay, so all of those involve a lot of uh, matrix calculations. But they're not just matrix calculations, they're not matrix calculations using integers. Okay? They are matrix cal- uh, ca- matrix calculations involving fractions and you know non-integral numbers. So that means you know, they are capable of doing fixed point or floating point calculations. Okay. So next question: Why?
why is NVIDIA worth three trillion dollars now? Because it's AI. Because of AI, very good, okay. Yeah, I like where this is going. And what do you think are the, some of the limitations of your why, uh, what limits your, the company from uh, offering us your AI on everything? Or inexpensive AI? So I think you got your hand up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm, nope, memory is not the most concerning thing that is limiting how much you can do with AI. Okay. What's the top CPU power, CPU power? Yep, CPU power. Okay, so how much, how much power do you have to crunch numbers? Because the training of neural nets takes a lot of juice. Okay, it takes a lot of uh, processing. So now we go to NVIDIA again. It's like, but why is NVIDIA making all the money and not Intel? Yep. Because the computer, um, the computer chips that are in this portion, they're in CPU chips, but they're also very heavily market dominated in CPUs. Yep. So CPUs are by design capable to perform um, certain types of calculation, like multiply and add, okay? You know, they combine those operations into one single operation. Where in a normal CPU, you have to go like, okay, here's multiplication, and this is addition. Here's multiplication, and here's addition. The GPUs can do that like that, okay? How many cores do you think you have on your gaming computer? You know, the Intel or AMD processor? So what is a practical number of the number of cores on your CPU, the central processing unit? Four hundred sixteen. Okay. And how many GPUs do you have? How many cooler processors is on a medium-sized you know, uh, graphics card, like a three hundred dollar you know, graphics card? Eight thousand. I know, like the operating system. Yep. So there you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, let's figure it out, okay? You know, I'm interested to find that out too. So you will see me doing this a lot. You know, in class, I'm gonna do a Google search and I'm just ask, gonna ask the question, how many CUDA, which is the name of the GPU processor, uh, CUDA cores in a $300 graphics card? There we go. So it says it's a mid-range, so 300 bucks is about mid-range. 3,584. So do you see how it is much more cost effective to buy a $300 you know, GPU or graphics card to accelerate your gameplay than to spend all the money to buy the highest end possible Intel or AMD processor? Be because if you spend like $1,000 to get the top of the line Xeon, you know, Xenon, um, processor from Intel, it's not going to help you squat with your gameplay. <laughs> because you know, the rendering of the graphics involves a lot of parallel processing where the GPU can go like, okay, just, just give me you know, all those objects and, and I'll try to figure out you know, what to draw on the two-dimensional screen. It can do it in a, in a flash. But then your Intel processor is going to like, oh, okay, I can do it one dot at a time. Not exactly that, but it's going to be a lot longer. Okay, so that is why. Okay, I know you know, this sounds like a big detour from what we are talking about. So let's bring that back to the context. All right. So we know the CUDA processor can be used for all kinds of math calculation. It can do it really fast, and on a per core basis, it is inexpensive. Okay. So as it turns out, you know, a lot of the neural net calculation to train the neural net to train your model involves the same kind of calculation as your game, okay? So that's why, you know, even before the current AI trend, um, people have been using the CUDA core for, you know, doing AI training and whatnot, okay? The, there are two main limitations. If you want to have your own AI startup company and you want to be like, oh, I got a great idea to apply this technology to Bob, okay? There are two main limitations. One, can you even buy 
first the importance of production. Two, the decay of means of access to the energy. So as it turns out, the AI industry is consuming a lot of energy. So you, you, you can actually just read that up to AI industry energy consumption consumption. Oh, this is way more. Yeah, I think this is way more. Because mining is an individual thing for the most part. You know, people just buy like, oh, we're gonna buy 10 of this convenient part and then uh, we will just sell it as my industry in the winter. <laughs> because that's what it's good for too. Um, so you can see that 8% of the US power by 2030, you know, projected, is gonna be used by AI. That's national. 8% of the national energy consumption goes into the AI industry in 2030, which is just in a few years. Okay? That is a lot of energy. If you don't think about it that way, okay, if you compare that to the, the steel industry where they have these you know, gigantic smelters and they turn everything into glowing hot, you know, red hot you know, stuff, I think this is going to overshadow you know, all the other industries. So those two are the constraints. Um, Google, I know for sure that Google is already certified to um, pro to produce power, so they can actually make their own power plant right next to their data center if they want to. So they're already planning for this because they know they are going to need a lot of power for AI you know, to work and stuff like that. Okay. Wrapping everything back, I know you guys are dying to do the lab, but wrapping everything all the way back, what does that say to you? In other words, what career choices do you think, you know, maybe, hmm, maybe I should, I should look into it. Computer science. Computer science is one. Right? Computer science. Are you in computer science? Yep. Um, data modeling, data science, that type of thing. But specific to this class, the material that I'm teaching also relates to computer engineering. And that is the kind of study where people need in order to design more efficient GPU cores. So I think that's going to remain hot for like the next, at least the next two to four years. If you know, they, you know, these companies like NVIDIA, Intel is trying to catch up, AMD is trying to catch up. But they all need computer, not software, computer engineers to help you know, make the design more, uh, have higher performance, but consume less power, more optimized. So that is how everything kind of relates back to this class. This class, for the longest time, people take this class only because it is one of the requirements to graduate with a computer science degree. But I think there's actual practical value in this class now that you know NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, they're all trying to compete and they're trying to come up with better and more efficient designs. And one last thing, I'm gonna open up the lab. Did you guys know that the CEO of AMD is a cousin of the CEO of NVIDIA? I did not know until this morning. Yeah, it came up this morning. Yep, well that was a feed. I just found it to be quite interesting. <laughs> well, both, both of them will used to work at AMD, right? So if I'm if I recall, I think when Ben used to work in, in AMD, and then Ben too at that point was going to AMD, I think. Did he also work at um, um, SGI, Silicon Silicon Graphics yeah. Incorporated? Yeah. Because that is the origin of all the GPU stuff is SGI, you know, Silicon Graphics Incorporated. They got bought by AMD, and maybe at that point, um, uh, Jen Jensen Huang you know, got into the whole GPU stuff. Yeah. API at that point? Oh, right, there's APIs in between. Yeah. So there's Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SGI, the API, and then the AMD, and then the split you know, becomes NVIDIA, and so on. And that's why a AMD still has Radeon, their own line of GPUs, 
-hmm. And Intel is way behind the curve. <laughs> well, they're way behind the curve in CPUs as well, but that's a different story. All right, so I'm going to release the lab so that you guys can start on it. So the lab today relates to the lab on Monday. You can download your own file back from the assignment on Monday because you're going to use it for the lab today. All right, so let me make it visible to you. Give me a second. Uh, we are using NAN2 here. So this and this are now released. The, uh, there's an access code to NAN2, the lab, and it is called NANDROID. <laughs> Negated Android. All over case. You're going to write it on the whiteboard so I can turn off the projector at some point. Man droid. So, all right, I'm going to stop the recorder and then I'll upload the.